Before the Second World War, Europe was home to roughly 9 to 12 million Jewish people. There were Jewish communities in every European country, but the largest Jewish population, more than 3 million, was in Poland. In the countries of Eastern Europe, Jewish communities formed an important part of life in all the big cities, as well as in many smaller towns and villages. It was a lively world that hummed with different ideas about how to live a good life. The majority continued to live their lives much as their parents and grandparents had before them. But others turned their backs on traditional beliefs and ways of life. Instead, they joined mainstream society or became members of political movements that held the promise of a brighter future. Not only for Jewish people, but for mankind as a whole. So, across Europe, there were many different ways of being Jewish. There were Jewish people who were deeply religious, those who marked just a few religious festivals, and atheists who didn't believe in God at all. All belonged to a wider world that could be hostile, even dangerous. Every year, on the Sunday nearest to the 27th of January, we commemorate Holocaust Memorial Day here in Ireland. I invite Evelyn Byrne, Chairperson of Holocaust Education Trust Ireland, to introduce this evening of remembrance. Uchtaran, Lord Mayor, ladies and gentlemen, on this very special evening of remembrance of the Holocaust, on the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. We welcome you here this evening. As we move to the next decade of the 21st century, memories of the Second World War, the circumstances which brought it about, and most importantly, the horrors of the Holocaust are in danger of fading. When memories grow faint, the lessons of history grow dangerously dim. Largely gone are those who survived beyond the gates of hell and those who witnessed their suffering when liberating the camps. We are blessed this evening to be joined by Susie and Tommy. But with few left to carry the burden of memory, because make no mistake about it, a burden that memory is, not just to those who carry it, but to the generations who follow them. It becomes even more important for us now to educate the generations who follow us, the generations now living, to educate them about the inhumanity which man can inflict on man. It falls on us to remind future generations what happens when all that is decent and all that is good is lost. Because together, whatever our role in society, it falls on us to ensure that never ever again is a situation allowed to be unleashed which will unleash events as catastrophic as the Holocaust, where millions of Jews and others were deprived not only of liberty, but of the very right to be treated as human beings. It is for that reason that we can never forget. I invite our host, Lord Mayor of Dublin, Paul McAuliffe, to welcome you.
Uktran Irard Vera, Corlori. On behalf of the city and people of Dublin, it is a great honour to host this important national event, which is held each year in the Round Room at the Mansion House. We feel privileged to be among the survivors of the Holocaust and the descendants of survivors, the descendants of the righteous, and to those people who made Dublin and Ireland their home. Holocaust Memorial Day marks the date of the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau on the 27th of January 1945, which took place exactly 75 years ago, less than one lifetime to remember the loss of so many lifetimes. Tonight, we recall the suffering inflicted on the Jewish people of Europe and on those other faiths and ethnicities persecuted during the Holocaust. We reflect on this and on the suffering still being inflicted on people throughout the world today. We reflect on the challenge for each generation to reject intolerance, anti-Semitism, racism on those people who seek to divide us. We acknowledge the work of the Holocaust Education Trust Ireland in its endeavours to re-educate and inform about the Holocaust and to ensure that this dark page of our history is always remembered. I invite President of Ireland, Michael D. Higgins, to address us. Lord Mayor and friends, I welcome this opportunity to be here with you this evening to mark National Holocaust Memorial Day, which falls tomorrow on the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. So may I thank the Holocaust Education Trust for its invitation and the Lord Mayor of Dublin for hosting this important event. And we are indeed honoured to have Holocaust survivors Tommy Rickenthal and Susie Diamond with us this evening. And with them, Kinga Pashko, whose family received the honour of Righteous Among Nations for saving the lives of a Jewish family during the Holocaust. Their presence and words are so important in helping us to bear witness to the level to which human actions sank. On every occasion we hear them, your personal recollections remind us of the millions of individual stories which make up the narrative of the Shoah. The families torn from each other, the deaths suffered and witnessed, the lost potential and the brutal assault on culture and identity. And we recall too, of course, the courage, the tenacity and generosity of spirit and great will to survive, which are also part of the Holocaust narrative. Three quarters of a century ago, the 60th Army of the First Ukrainian Front arrived at Auschwitz. And when they entered the concentration camp complex, it remains hard now still to imagine fully the horrors they uncovered, the mass graves and the remains of the 1.1 million people systematically murdered, their possessions and personal belongings that, so, that spoke so poignantly and more powerfully than any words could possibly do, strewn of the simplest and most basic intimacies of humanity, of those who were herded into the concentration camps and gas chambers, the sight of such appalling crimes. Those entering to liberate the camps discovered approximately 7,000 surviving prisoners, of which 180 were children, who had been left behind in Auschwitz by the fleeing Nazis. The vast majority of those murdered in Auschwitz were Jewish women, men and children. Others put to death in this horrible planned way included non-Jewish Polish people, members of the Roma community, Soviet prisoners of war, homosexuals, the disabled, and political and religious opponents. The sense of horror and revulsion felt by those who liberated Auschwitz has reverberated through the decades so hauntingly, for let us never forget 
that so little time separates us from the evil that was the Holocaust. This is not an event from any distant past. We have to also recognize that these actions were preceded by the hate of anti-Semitism and the excluding stereotypes of minorities, something we must be vigilant to ensure is recognized and unequivocally opposed now and in the future. It is so important that we remember, for by doing so we respectfully and solemnly commemorate those who died or suffered at the hands of the Nazis, and we vow to do all we can to ensure that such a horror can never occur again. To quote French philosopher Paul Ricoeur, to be forgotten is to die twice. And as humanitarians and reflexive, responsible human beings, we have a duty to preserve the memory of the many people whose lives were taken in such an appalling way. And it is so important that our collective memory of events like the Holocaust are shared, passed on, that it remains prominent in our collective consciousness. Memory is haunted, not just by ghostly others, but by the horrors that have been done, experienced, or witnessed. No wonder then that for Jorge Luis Borges, to remember is a ghostly verb. Memory indeed constitutes one of the greatest sources of interrogation bequeathed to us by the 20th century, with its cortege of pandemics, mass crimes, and grotesque experimentations with totalitarianism. The ethical practice of remembering is a cornerstone in our attempts to live morally and inclusively. And some 75 years on, the visible signs of World War II may have largely been erased from the rebuilt cities and towns of Europe, and fewer and fewer Holocaust survivors remain to tell their stories. And as time continues to pass, and as we move further away chronologically from this darkest period of history, it becomes even more important that we understand our obligation, the obligation that it is of remembering what led to that chapter, its consequences, and learn from it. It would be a grievous error to consign the Holocaust or the lessons that should be taken from it to a past that was assumed to be no longer relevant in our modern world. In the eight years since I first spoke at the Holocaust Memorial Day commemoration in Dublin, it is deeply worrying to observe an emerging trend of the rise of extremist language and politics across the streets of Europe. One that seeks to exploit what is often a loss of trust, but much more frequently informs a populism that invokes fear, exclusion, and rejection of the other. The commitment to multilateralism that resulted from the founding moments of the United Nations in the aftermath of World War II is no longer to be taken as a given. Several states, including some of the most powerful actors globally, are repudiating this multilateral order, pursuing narrow neo-nationalist agendas. This decision is as regrettable as it is myopic, displaying a dangerous ignorance of history. Furthermore, it is eroding the respect of international standards and laws, including the Geneva Conventions, the 75th anniversary of which was marked by an international conference at which I spoke last September. Refugees, immigrant communities, and other minority groups are increasingly described as a threat to the rights of the majority. The many achievements by those who have fought tirelessly for human rights are in peril from new courts, cohorts of extremists who view hard-won universal rights as somehow a threat to their own individual rights. We are witnessing the growing rise of various forms of a corrupted, distorted version of an exclusionary and often bogus, indeed mythical type of nationalism on virtually every continent. The toxicity of anti-Semitism is not absent from this rhetoric, and it should be identified and condemned for what it is, an invitation to hatred and hate speech. We in Ireland may have been fortunate that such extremism has not gained significant support at a time when many countries in Europe and elsewhere have seen the rise of a far right, 
often galvanised by the impact of austerity policy. Such movements manipulated fears and insecurities, wielding these as tools of xenophobia, seeking to excise the instincts of solidarity that are buried there across the peoples of Europe scapegoating migrants and refugees, presenting them as a threat to the job prospects of so-called native citizens. All of these being allegations rejected again and again by empirical research. However, despite the gradual economic recovery, an ugly anti-migrant sentiment is attempting to rear its head in Ireland. A corrupted form of populism has not abated across Europe, and anti-Semitism has not been eliminated from the extreme rhetoric of those seeking to scapegoat the vulnerable in order to inflame the bewildered and angry. Those forms of misused nationalism and populism are a salutary reminder of just how fragile democracy is, how it can never be taken for granted, how easily it can be undermined, when leaders and citizens turn away, not only from democratic rule and its dis but that its discourse is no longer respected. Those who proceed to deny opposing views any legitimacy, curtail civil liberties, and attempt to limit freedom of expression through undermining the freedom of the press. What a great failure it is that less than three generations after the catastrophe that was World War II, and given our boundless capacity for creativity and innovation, the fruits of new science and technology are being turned again not to the promotion and preservation of peace, but to the pursuit and prosecution of war, to a resile of old forms of hatred, exclusion and intolerance, to a discourse coarsened by its acceptance of aggression as the language of media and the street. We must all have the courage to ask how we have come to be losing the discourse of peace to the discourse of fear, and how the international armaments industry occupies a space that should be filled by those seeking to meet the needs of sufficiency in food, shelter, education, and cooperation, and indeed how we have come to accept the allocation of ecology, society, and even peace to such a narrow and limited version of economy a chronically unbalanced approach that has served us so badly and with such destructive consequences. We must, I suggest, combine our efforts to achieve the alternative, the widespread adoption of a new paradigm of sustained peace and development. And yet how depressing it is that the obvious parallels between the rise of fascism in the 1930s and our contemporary humanitarian and democratic crisis it appeared to be lost on so many. A survey last year found that 22% of adult Americans had never heard of the Holocaust, while 41% of Americans did not know what Auschwitz was, rising to 66% among millennials. We in Europe cannot be complacent either. A 2018 survey of seven European countries found that 5% had never heard of the Holocaust, with a quarter only knowing a little bit, and awareness levels lowest among young people. This is precisely why it is vital that awareness of the Holocaust and the rise of fascism in Europe in the 1930s should be a core part of the history curriculum across Europe and elsewhere, if we are to truly learn the lessons of history. And it also brings to mind the critical question as Eli Weissel, with the writer and concentration camp survivor, has so often asked, of how do we remember, how do we mourn the six million Jews and five million others who died? As anti-Semitism, xenophobia, racism and intolerance are once again on the rise in Europe and in many parts of the world, we must remember the Holocaust collectively and work together to ensure that hatred and inhumanity are not allowed to spread their dark shadow across Europe and the world. We must ensure as new generations emerge and their world becomes further removed from the horrors of the Holocaust chronologically, that we tell them that they too can learn from the actions of those who, by averting their gaze, allowed it to happen, who participated in it, who facilitated in it. We must ensure that every generation 
appreciates the shelter that a shared commitment to international law, its norms, practices and decisions provides for us all. Of the limitless possibilities that can be achieved from a shared humanity, practice with responsibility and cooperation. We must preserve sites such as Auschwitz and Birkenau, where I will be tomorrow to represent the Irish people at the 75th anniversary of the camp's liberation. Such sites of genocidal acts are visible and powerful reminders of the callous, willful annihilation of innocent people that was the fruit of hatred, racism and intolerance, that was permitted to flourish unhindered, and from which future generations can learn of the insidious dangers of extremism. Let us commit as a bulwark to our democracy on this Holocaust Memorial Day to remembering the atrocities of the Shoah and the bigotry, prejudice and denial of dignity and rights of the other which had led to it. Honouring our commitments under the Stockholm Declaration and the political declaration of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance of which Ireland is a member. Let us commit to ensuring that all those who lost their lives in Auschwitz-Birkenau and in all the other concentration camps where Jews and other minority groups were confined and killed will not be forgotten now or ever into the future. And as we remember, let us ensure too that we do not become passive observers of prejudice or inequality in our society. Avert our gaze but rather be alert to the rise of racism and hate speech. Continue to share a common obligation to value and uphold democracy, human dignity, liberty, equality, and the irreducible, indivisible rights and dignity of a shared humanity. The Nuremberg Laws, drawn up in 1935, were designed to penalize the Jewish people and to make them disappear from German society. I invite the Honorary Miss Justice Isolt O'Malley to give her reading. Laws introduced in 1935 deprived Jews of their German citizenship. They also prohibited Jewish people from marrying non-Jewish Germans. And for the first time, Jews were defined as a race. German Jews were no longer recognized as members of the German population. The Nuremberg Laws, as they became known, did not define a Jewish person as someone with particular religious beliefs. Instead, anyone who had three or four Jewish grandparents was defined as a Jew. Even people who had converted to Christianity many generations before were defined as Jews. Many Germans who had not practiced Judaism for years found themselves caught in the grip of Nazi terror. Jews were no longer able to work in academia, the civil service, the media, or serve in the military. Jewish businesses were appropriated by the Nazi state and Jewish banks and bank accounts belonging to Jews were confiscated. Jewish doctors were forbidden to treat non-Jews, and Jewish lawyers were no longer permitted to practice law. Other ordinances, in addition to the Nuremberg Laws, disenfranchised the Jewish people of Germany and deprived them of most of their civil rights and their human rights. 20 years ago, the Stockholm International Forum on the Holocaust was convened after a survey in Sweden revealed that more than 50% of teenagers claimed they had not heard of the Holocaust, or if they had, they did not believe it. In the year 2000, Ireland was one of 48 nations that signed the Stockholm Declaration, an international agreement between governments to commemorate and educate about the Holocaust. I invite Neil Burgess, Secretary General of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, to read a summary from this important document. We, 
the governments attending the Stockholm International Forum on the Holocaust recognize that it was a tragically defining episode of the 20th century, a crisis for Europe and a universal catastrophe. The unprecedented character of the Holocaust fundamentally challenged the foundations of civilization. After more than half a century, it remains an event close enough in time that survivors can still bear witness to the horrors that engulfed the Jewish people. The terrible suffering of millions of Jewish people and other victims of the Nazis has left an indelible stain across Europe that must forever be seared in our collective memory. The selfless sacrifices of those who defied the Nazis and sometimes gave their own lives to protect or rescue Holocaust victims must also be inscribed in our hearts. We pledge to strengthen our efforts to promote education, remembrance and research about the Holocaust in our schools, universities, communities and other institutions. With humanity still scarred by anti-Semitism, genocide, ethnic cleansing, racism, xenophobia and other expressions of hatred, we commit to fight against these evils and to reaffirm our common aspiration for a democratic and tolerant society, free of prejudice and other forms of bigotry. Survivors live in Ireland. All of them were children during the Holocaust, and all of them found their way to Ireland by different means. Each of them lost many family members in the Shoah, and each has his or own personal tale of survival. I invite Tommy Reichenthal to tell his story. I'm here today not because who I am, but because what I am. I am a Jew and I am a survivor of the Holocaust. I was born in Slovakia in 1935. I was just nine years old when I was captured by the Nazis along with my mother, brother, grandmother, aunt, and cousin. We were herded into cattle cart, and from that moment onwards, we were treated worse than animals. There was no privacy, no hygiene. The stench and condition were unbearable. Eventually, after seven nights in the cattle car train, stop. The doors were opened and we were greeted with shout from the SS with gun pointing and barking dogs. We had arrived at our destination, Bergen-Belsen concentration camp. I was there from November 1944 until the liberation of the camp in 15 April 1945. What I witnessed as a nine-year-old boy is impossible to describe. The starvation, the cruelty of the camp guards, the cold and disease, people who were just skin and bone and looked like living skeleton were walking around very slowly. Some of them dropped on the ground never to get up again. They were dying in their hundreds. The emaciated bodies left where they fell or thrown into heap. In front of our barracks, there were piles of decomposing corpses. From many prisoners in Belgium, Belsen, 
their condition were too much to bear, and they threw themselves on the barbed wire at night to be shot in order to put an end to their misery. We found their corpses there in the morning. 70,000 prisoners of Belgian Belsen are buried there in mass grave. I lost 35 members of my family in the Holocaust. Gradually, Jewish people were squeezed out of German society. I invite the artist, Mick O'Dee, to give us his reading. The book burnings of 1933 heralded the Nazi policy to ban anything associated with Jewish people. Jewish religious books and books by Jewish authors were burned in public bonfires, along with other authors proclaimed to be un-German. Jewish writers, actors, film directors and artists were no longer able to find work, and Jewish composers and musicians were dismissed. Art created by Jewish artists was condemned as degenerate. Their paintings and artworks were ripped from public exhibitions and private homes. Much of it was destroyed. Jewish artists were ridiculed and beaten in public, and works of art owned by Jewish people were confiscated by the Nazis. Very soon, 
Jews were not allowed in public places such as cafes, cinemas, theatres, sport centres, libraries or shops. They could no longer sit on park benches which had not for Jews stenciled on them. Jewish people were not allowed to ride on trams. Jews could no longer go to the opera. Even if they could, they would not hear music written by Jews or played by Jews or sung by Jews. There were Nazi police everywhere preventing the Jews from going wherever they had always been able to go. By July 1938, as pressure was increased on Jews to leave Germany and German-occupied lands, hundreds of thousands tried to flee. I invite journalist and writer Sorka Pollock to tell us about the Evian Convention and its parallels in our world today. Thirty-two countries were represented at the Avian Conference in July 1938, including Ireland. Delegates at the event were asked if they would accept Jewish refugees. Most countries said they had no room for Jews or that their quotas were already full. One country even stated that no Jew is too many. With nowhere to turn, Jews found themselves trapped within their own borders. Today, as the world debates the difficulties arising from vast numbers of refugees requesting asylum in Europe, we are reminded of similar discussions that took place at the Avian Conference during the Holocaust some 80 years ago. Images of boats crossing the Mediterranean crammed with desperate refugees remind us of similar voyages undertaken by Jewish people during the Second World War. The San Luis set sail from Hamburg in 1939, bound for the United States, with 937 Jewish people on board. The promised US visas never materialized, and permission to land in the US was rescinded. The ship was forced to return to Europe, where many of the Jewish passengers ultimately perished in the Shoah. People today are still fleeing persecution, tyranny, and war. They are embarking on perilous journeys, desperate to find refuge somewhere safe. Not a lot has changed since the years of the Holocaust. The state-sanctioned violence of Kristallnacht on the 9th of November 1938 marked a turning point in Nazi persecution of the Jewish people. I invite Gwendolyn Morgan, human rights lawyer at the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission, to tell us about the November pogrom. Kristallnacht erupted across Germany and Austria as the SS, Nazi police, Hitler Youth and locals rampaged through the streets on that November night. Hundreds of synagogues, Jewish schools and businesses were destroyed and set ablaze. Windows were smashed, leaving the streets strewn with glass. Over a thousand Jews were beaten to death or committed suicide out of despair. Some 35,000 Jewish men were thrown into concentration camps. Jewish cemeteries were desecrated. And thousands of apartments and shops belonging to Jewish people were looted. After the destruction, the Jewish communities were fined one billion Reichsmarks to pay for the damage. The horrific violence that took place during Kristallnacht impacted profoundly on the Jewish communities as important of what might lie ahead. It convinced them that they were in imminent danger. I invite Andrew Wolfe of the Jewish Representative Council of Ireland to tell us about the rules of identification imposed upon Jewish people by the Nazis. 
Oshin Stapleton Doyle will read from the diary of 15-year-old Yitzhak from Vilna about wearing the yellow star. The Nazis forced Jewish people to wear identifying marks, yellow stars of David to be worn as badges, or white armbands with blue stars on them. Like everyone in Germany, Jews were required to carry identity papers, but special identifying marks were added to those of Jewish people. A large letter J was stamped on their passports and the middle names of Sarah for females and Israel for males were introduced. This enabled the Nazi police to easily identify Jews. The decree was issued that the Vilna Jewish population must put on badges front and back. I was ashamed to appear in them on the street, not because it would be noticed that I am a Jew, but because I was ashamed of what they were doing to us. I was ashamed of our helplessness. More than 1,300 ghettos were created throughout Nazi-occupied Europe. I invite Ed O'Neill of the UN High Commission on Human Rights to tell us about them. It's estimated that more than one million Jewish people died in the ghettos, which were created in every country occupied by the Germans. There were places of incarceration, brutality, and starvation. It suited, it suited the Nazis if they could claim that people in the ghettos were dying from natural causes. Many ghettos were walled in or fenced off, and Jews who left them without permission were severely punished. The inhabitants of the ghettos soon realized that the ghetto served as a place to destroy them physically and psychologically, and their eventual fate would be death. Although there are heroic stories of resistance, most of the ghetto populations were murdered and there were few survivors. I invite Shane O'Curry of the Irish Network Against Racism to tell us about the camp system operated by the SS. Youth reader Ella Nethercott will read from the diary of 14-year-old Kitty from Poland. There were thousands of concentration camps, slave labor camps and transit camps throughout the territories occupied by Nazi Germany. Jews and others incarcerated in these camps were worked or beaten to death or perished from exhaustion, cold, hunger or disease. Six death camps were established by the Nazis, all of them on Polish soil, where approximately three million Jews and thousands of other victims were murdered in gas chambers. They were ushered into undressing areas where they were told to leave their clothes neatly on the numbered pegs and to tie their shoes together to make them easier to find when they came back from their showers. They never came back. Their clothing, shoes and personal belongings were sorted and sold in markets back in Germany. Human hair was used in the manufacture of textiles. This systematic industrial process of murder was unprecedented in human history. As evening came, the whole sky was red. Smoke and flames were pouring out of all the chimneys. Here were the death factories. It is barely credible to someone like myself who lived through the worst of it, that members of a younger generation today cannot believe it happened at all. But I did live through it. I do know it happened. I was there. When the German army invaded Russia in June 1941, it was followed by special killing units. I invite Nick Henderson of the Irish Refugee Council to give his reading about the killing squads. The killing squads were made up of SS, army and police officers, and a great many local collaborators. They rounded up Jews in shtetls, towns and villages, forcing them into cemeteries, 
forests and ravines where they were murdered in their thousands at point-blank range. Many had to dig their own graves before being shot into them. Entire communities were annihilated in this method of face-to-face -face killing. Holocaust survivor Jan Kaminski passed away in Dublin last year. As a child, he witnessed the destruction of the Jewish people of his town. I invite his daughter, Yaja, to tell us Jan's story. My father was born Heim Schulzidner, the second of four children in the town of Bilgorai in eastern Poland. In 1942, when he was just 10 years old, the entire Jewish population was dispatched to certain and immediate death in the nearby Belzac death camp. During these roundups, my father fled into the nearby forest, forest, becoming permanently separated from his family. It was no longer safe for him to identify as Jewish, and so he changed his name to Jan Kaminski. Surviving the war on the run, foraging in the woods, living off farms and always hiding. When the war ended, his parents Suslam and Mindla, and his sisters Hannah Matla and Rivka, and his baby brother, whose name had not yet been rec recorded, had all disappeared. For more than 30 years, he searched for any one of his family who might have survived, but to date, no trace of his immediate family members have been found. Word reached Berlin that some members of the killing squads found their work distressing. They asked head office to find a more efficient way of murdering Jews. I invite Dr. Carol Baxter, Assistant Secretary General and Head of Civil Justice and Equality Policy at the Department of Justice and Equality to tell us about the Von Say Conference. On 20th January 1942, 15 high-ranking Nazis and government officials were invited by Reinhard Heydrich, chief of the Reich's security main office, to a conference in a lakeside villa at Wannsee outside Berlin. He asked the delegates to endorse Hitler's plans to introduce mechanisms for the total annihilation of the Jewish people of Europe. Adolf Eichmann presented the delegates with a list of the number of Jews living in each European country whom the Nazis intended to annihilate. Ireland appears on the list with a total of 4,000 Jews. The delegates debated at length who was Jewish according to bloodline considerations and discussed evacuation and resettlement, euphemisms for murder. They concluded that a more efficient method of killing was necessary, one that would produce little residue and spare those operating the killing sites the negative psychological trauma of face-to-face -face killing. Over fine food, brandy and cigars, it took the delegates less than two hours to unanimously endorse Hitler's final solution to the Jewish question, the murder of the Jewish people by poison gas. I invite Anastasia Crickley, former president of the UN Committee for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, to give her reading. After the devastation of the Holocaust, which left two-thirds of the Jewish people of Europe murdered and their culture and history on the brink of oblivion, it was hard to imagine that Jewish life could be rebuilt on that troubled soil. Yet, that is what happened over decades in a more united continent. Reconciliation replaced mistrust, and those same nations began a process of critical self-examination, acknowledging the role that they and their citizens played in the Holocaust. It was this process, as much as the improving economic conditions, that restored European Jews' sense of confidence. Most European states have come to terms with their past, but can they handle the present? Today, 
Jews are being attacked in the streets, in synagogues, and in their homes. Leaders of Jewish communities are urging their members, for safety's sake, not to wear their kippot in public. Heavily armed police or military guards patrol in front of synagogues, Jewish schools, and Jewish institutions in a number of European countries. Hungarian Jews watch a populist government honor fascist era leaders complicit in the crimes of the Holocaust. The rise in the number of white supremacist and neo-Nazi movements is gaining traction around the world. Social media is providing a conduit for fermenting hate speech and vile images, providing platforms where extremist rhetoric becomes legitimate. The more this language is repeated, and the more it seeps into the national discourse, the more it becomes acceptable and mainstreamed. Daubings on shop windows and synagogues are all too reminiscent of Kristallnacht that left poverty belonging to Jews destroyed, synagogues burnt, and Jewish people murdered. Remembering that genocidal tragedy of the Holocaust in the last century leads us to address the challenges we place in the present one. Public declarations and acts of anti-Semitism are still hateful, prejudiced, and wrong. They must be called out for what they are, whenever and wherever they are manifested. I invite Karina Camerino, whose grandfather Enzo survived Auschwitz-Birkenau, but who lost many members of her family in the Shoah, to give her reading about the uniqueness of the Holocaust for Jewish people. The final solution was a systematic attempt by the Nazis and their collaborators to murder every Jew in every country of Europe stretching as far north as Norway, as far south as Rhodes, as far east as Russia, and as far west as Ireland. They also included those Jews living in the countries of North Africa. Six million Jews perished in the Holocaust. One and a half million of these victims were children. The Nazis also murdered millions of other victims, but as Elie Wiesel reminds us, it is true that not all victims were Jews, but all Jews were victims. We must prevent future generations from thinking of the Holocaust in terms of anonymous, faceless numbers. Every victim has a name. Several people living in Ireland, Jews and non-Jews, lost cherished family members in the Holocaust, whose names we have included in the scroll of names. For some of them, we know their place of birth their country of origin, their age, and their place of death. For others, we have only their names, which are included in the scroll. In this small way, we honor their memory and give them a personal Irish memorial. I invite pupils of Stratford College, Dublin, Pertumna Community School, County Galway, Our Ladies College, Greenhills, County Louth, Assumption Secondary School, Walkingstown, Dublin, to read from the Scroll of Names. Max Heller, Clara Heller, Gisela Molnar, Sandar Molnar, Baila Hirschberg, Matthias Hirschberg, Rukla Orzel, Slasma Erbach. Hirsch Erbach, Tauba Erbach, David Joseph Erbach, Shaul Erbach, Abe Zvi Erbach, Gidla Freyla Erbach, Leah Freyla Erbach, Sarah Mordecai Erbach, Chiel Erbach, Simon Erbach, Neuheim Erbach, Fegla Erbach, Perla Erbach, Frymetta Erbach, Moses Klein, Hilda Frankel, Kurt Frankel, Walter Frankel, Herbert Frankel, 
Fritz Frankel, Sigmund Frankel, Salomon Delmont, Caroline Wolf, Wolf, Sally Wolf, Henrietta Wolf, Rosetta Wolf, Ellie Velva Lavisansky, David Philip, Rekha Philip, Leopold Philip, Julia Philip, Dagbert Philip, Louis Philip from Minsk, Valeria Philip, Rosalia Shoimovitz, Julius Meyer, Geza Surrey, Oscar Shoimovitz, Katerina Fried, Agnes Fried, Ezekiel Reichenthal, Katerina Reichenthal, Kalmar Reichenthal, Ilona Reichenthal, Jitta Reichenthal, Ibai Reichenthal, Desider Reichenthal, Ferdinand Alt, Renka Alt, Erna Elbert, Marta Elbert, Joseph Drexler, Drexler Medriska Drexler, Drexler, Bella Pearlberg, Irma Popper, Jura Mataya, Ifsha Mataya, Ankisha Mataya, Kalman Rosenthal, Eleonora Rosenthal, Abraham Sustil, Poland Sustil, David Sustil, Shemon Sustil, Regina Sustil, Rapay Sustil, Marta Sustil, Shabtai Sustil, Adela Sustil, Agedni Sustil Brudo, Emmanuel Brudo, Sustil Children, Heinrich Heinbeck, Selma Heinbeck, Simka Zax, Rivka Zax, Borel Zax, Zisa Zax, Nachman Zax, Hannah Zax, Aaron Zax, Zax, Hannah Sherhai, Joel Dove Zax, Jital Zax, Shoshana Zax, Shaina Zax, Masha Zax, Rosa Zax, Tyla Feek Fackler, David Mayer Fackler, Moshe Fackler, Gaila Fackler, Shane Del Milkman, Yehil Milkman, Theo Milkman, Joseph Milkman, Pepe Gerzib, Haya Milkman, Maya Milkman. Noza Nota Fakler, Esther Zarka Yukubovich, Mimi Alta Malekman, Levi Fakler, Izzy Fakler, Nathan Fakler, Johanna Carlsberg Summer, Emil Summer, Etty Steinberg, Leon Gluck, Volchek Gluck, Hatzekel Abram, Belia Abram, Osaya Joseph Abram, Sigmund Segel Kohn. Carolina Herbst, Elsa Zimak, Denny Zimak, Abraham Humberg, Emma Humberg, Gerda Feist, Fanny Kaufman, Adolf Humberg, Raphael German, Carl German, David German, Hannah Matla Zibner, Rivka Zibner, Baby Zibner, Mindla Zibner, Daughter of Frandla Zeibner, Schendla Zeibner, Joseph Zeibner, Mendel Kirsner, Shana Bella Kirsner, Obse Kirsner, Shana Riva Kirsner, Shifra Kirsner, Rash Kirsner, Yankel Kirsner, Wanda Camarino, Renato De Cori, Italo Camarino, Julia De Cori, Miriam Natalovich, Mayor Nevtulovich, Sidonia Nevtulovich, Hani Moskovica, Chaim Moskovich, Benjamin Moskovich, Mark Moskovich, Isidore Moskovich, Shimshon Hertz, Kyla Hertz, Scheindel Hertz, Abraham Hertz, Royza Hertz, Yosef Hertz, Lieb Hertz, Mayor Rashovsky, Rachel Rashovsky, Kyla Rashovsky, Hirsch Rashovsky, Mikola Kachtov, Sayoma Kachtov, Devora Krasnik, Miriam Krasnik, Hena Krasnik, Fega Krasnik, Annie Ottenwolf, David Glasson, Jeanette Glasson, Paul Talma, Sarah Talma, Isaac Shisi, Ephraim Sachs, Lena Jean Sachs.
Simon Weil, Holocaust survivor and founder of the Memorial de la Shoah in Paris, reminds us of the importance of keeping this memory of the Holocaust alive. I invite Aidan O'Driscoll, Secretary General of the Department of Justice and Equality, to give his reading. The Holocaust was intended not to have any witnesses. The Nazi plan was to erase an entire people from the history and memory of the world. The Jews were not supposed to survive. Everything was planned, thought out and organized so as not to leave any evidence of the murderous project. The existence of the gas chambers was kept hidden like a state secret. The Nazi death machine was designed to eradicate not only the Jews and gypsies as peoples, but also all evidence of their annihilation. It was the survivors themselves who first acknowledged their responsibility for passing on knowledge of the Holocaust and keeping its memory alive. For this reason, it is essential to teach about the Shoah, whether there are Jews in your respective countries or not, whether there are many or few or none left. The Shoah should never be diluted, denied, distorted, or trivialized. Thousands of Irishmen served with the British Army during the Second World War. I invite Colonel Stephen Ryan of the Irish Defence Forces to give his reading about liberation. Neve Fanning will read from the diary of 12-year-old Hava from Poland. Allied troops started liberating Nazi concentration and death camps from July 1944 onwards. Soviet troops reached Auschwitz in January 1945. The number of Irishmen who served with the British forces during the Second World War is estimated to be some 70,000. Many were with the British Liberation Forces as Nazi camps were opened and the horrors of the Holocaust were revealed. Reverend Father Michael Morrissey was a Roman Catholic chaplain to the British unit that liberated Bergen-Belsen concentration camp. He wrote in his diary of supporting the troops, comforting the survivors, 
and burying the mounds of dead corpses. Albert Sutton, who also served with a liberation unit, spoke of feeling his military service had been worthwhile when he met survivors such as Susie and Tommy. Liberation was not always joyful for the, fight for the survivors, especially Jewish survivors, who had lost everything, their families and their homes. Most had no one left and nowhere to go. They referred to themselves as the spared remnant. And yet, anti-Semitism still prevailed in those years after liberation, when more than 1,500 violent pogroms occurred against the Jews in Central Europe. We had been liberated. I was no longer only a number doomed to die in a Nazi gas chamber, a prisoner without the right to life. Germany had been defeated. Once again, I was an ordinary girl. True, I was different from other girls my age, very different in many ways, but I was free. Dr. Bob Collis worked as a volunteer doctor in the former Bergen-Belsen concentration camp immediately after the war. He brought six orphans back with him to Ireland. Among those children were brother and sister Tibor and Susie Molnar, who Bob arranged to have adopted by a Jewish couple, Willie and Elsie Samuels. Susie Diamond, a Holocaust survivor, will now tell us her story. I was born Susie Molnar in the small town of Karzak in Hungary in 1942. We were a small family comprising of my mother Gazella, my father Sandor, my brother Terry, and myself. In 1942, my father was forcibly conscripted into the slave labor service of the Hungarian army and deported to the Soviet Union where he perished in 1943. In July 1944, in just eight weeks, Adolf Eichmann organized the roundup and deportation of nearly half a million Hungarian Jews. The majority of them were sent directly to Auschwitz-Birkenbau, where most of them perished in the gas chambers. Some were sent to other concentration camps. During these weeks, the Gestapo came for my mother, brother, and me. We were deported first to Ravensbrück and then to Bergen-Belsen concentration camp, where my mother died shortly after liberation. Terry and I were very young children when we came to Ireland. We grew up believing we were the only two members of our family to have survived. In 2007, Terry passed away and I was the only one left. But things changed unexpectedly in 2015, when I was discovered by a first cousin still living in Karzak, and I learned a little bit about my family. My father was one of four brothers who ran a timber business. Two of them perished in the Holocaust, and two survived. I've, I have also learned that I have first cousins living in Hungary and in the United States. I have a family. I have visited Kozak and seen my grandfather's house, the Jewish cemetery where my grandparents are buried, and the synagogue where, all, where my family prayed. 778 Jews lived in Kozak before the war. 461 of them were murdered in the Holocaust. Most important for me is the memory scroll on the synagogue wall recording the Jews from Karzak who perished in the Holocaust. My family is listed on the scroll, but this has to be corrected because my brother and I were not murdered, we survived. In 1963, Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Remembrance Authority in Israel, 
inaugurated the award of Righteous Among the Nations to honour non-Jews who risked their lives to save Jewish people during the Holocaust. Only a fraction of the Jewish people were saved, and yet thousands of people in every country occupied by the Nazis risked their lives to save Jews. There are some 26,000 names of righteous listed in the Yad Vashem records. I invite Kinga Paschko, originally from Poland, but now living in Ireland, to tell us about her great-grandparents and their heroic story. Małżesz and Lisa Alchler were Jewish shopkeepers from the town of Huszetyn. They had two sons, Dov and Jakob. During the liquidation of Kapuczyńca Getta and after the murder of their son Jakob by local farmers, the Alchler family escaped. With much difficulty, they made their way to the village of Czabarówka, where they knocked on the door of my great-grandfather, Franciszek Hobowicz, who was the village headmaster, and asked for his help. The two families were strangers to each other at that point. Although they were poor, all four of the Hobovich family agreed to shelter the Alchilers. They knew that sheltering Jews from the Nazis was a big risk, often punishable by death. My great-grandfather prepared a hiding place for the Alchilers on their farm. They brought food to them in the buckets, just like they fed the animals, so as not to arouse suspicion. Both families suffered much deprivation, fear, and hardship throughout their time in hiding. Afraid of vengeance from their neighbors, even after the war, the Hobovich kept their rescue operation secret. Thanks to the help of my great-grandparents, the Altschiller survived the Holocaust. In 1947, they emigrated to Earth, Israel. Over the years, the two families kept in touch, and visited each other in Israel, in Poland. On, 10, on the 1st of August, 1993, Helena and Franciszek Hobowicz, their sons Zbigniew, Alexander, and Kazimierz Wiesław, were recognized by Yad Vashem as righteous amongst the nations. And I feel it's my legacy to say, no matter whether you're Polish, Jewish, Irish, or Irish traveler, it's not us and them, or us and you. It's all us. As my friend from the traveling community said one day, in the end of the day, we're all human. And I would add, to survive, there is no other way than to stand up for each other. Another brother and sister who Bob Collis brought back to Ireland from Bergen-Belsen were Zoltan and Edith Zinn Collis, who Bob reared in his own home and who took Bob's name as part of their own. They lived fulfilling lives in Ireland for more than 30 years. They both passed away in December 2012, leaving behind their Irish families, many of whom are here this evening. I invite one of Zoltan's daughters, Caroline, to give her reading. Our father, Zoltan, came from Czechoslovakia. He and his sister, Edith, were the only survivors of their family. By coincidence, they had met Susie and Terry in Bergen-Belsen concentration camp as very young children, and our two families have been in touch ever since. Growing up in Ireland, we were the only pupils in our school who could spell Czechoslovakia correctly. It was unusual to be a Holocaust survivor. Survivors of the Holocaust have very few relations. We've got used to having very small families, at least from one side. No grandparents, no uncles, no aunts, no cousins. We've been endowed with the title second generation, and this brings with it an important responsibility to transmit the memory of the Holocaust to future generations. But we can also rejoice in our own lives, in our new families, our children and our grandchildren. Hitler did not win. One or both of our parents survived. And we are here, living our lives, looking towards the future. A great number of Holocaust survivors made their homes in Israel after the war. 
I invite His Excellency, Mr. Ophir Karev, Ambassador of Israel, to give his reading about the close association with Israel and the Shoah. On the 27th of January, 1945, Auschwitz-Birkenau, the largest Nazi concentration and death camp, was liberated by the Red Army. This death camp, one of many, has become a symbol of the deliberate, well-planned Nazi plan to exterminate the Jewish people and wipe us from the face of the earth. That plan failed. 75 years have passed, and last week, more than 40 world leaders gathered in Jerusalem, the capital of Israel, the independent nation state of the Jewish people, for the fifth World Holocaust Forum under the auspices of the President of Israel, Reuven Rivlin. Many of the survivors found their home in the newly established, re-established state. Israel was not re-established because of the Holocaust. It exists because it is the historic home of the Jewish people. It is where we came from and where we returned to after 2,000 years in exile. Yet, the duty to remember the Holocaust and the commitment to prevent it from happening again are well engraved into its DNA. The Fifth World Holocaust Forum in Jerusalem was entitled Remembering the Holocaust, Fighting Antisemitism. As President Rivlin said, we remember not from a sense of superiority and not to wallow in the memories of the horrors or from a sense of self-justification. We remember because we know what is not to remember when history repeats, repeats itself. Unfortunately, our gathering here today is taking place against the background of the rise in hateful and violent expressions of anti-Semitism, especially in Europe. The Holocaust aimed at the total annihilation of all Jews everywhere and the eradication of their culture and history was fueled by extreme racist anti-Semitism. In the aftermath of the Second World War, the international community enacted universal principles and, inst and instituted international organizations with the express purpose of averting future crimes against humanity. The ways in which anti-Semitism has persisted since the war and proliferated over recent years needs to be identified, studied, and understood. World leaders must be alert to anti-Semitism's current manifestations and remain resolute in combating it where it appears. In this context, the IRA definition of antisemitism, a comprehensive definition that includes all types of contemporary antisemitism, is a meaningful tool in the fight against antisemitism, both in education and political discourse and in the field of law enforcement. I will conclude again with the words of President Rivlin. Together, we will continue to fight anti-Semitism and racism. We will fight Holocaust denial. We will educate our sons and daughters. We will remember and research so that history does not repeat itself. The age of responsibility, the responsibility of all of us sitting here is not over. Thank you. Genocides have taken place over the centuries and still occur to this day. I invite Robert Gervart, Professor of Modern History at University College Dublin, to give his reading. The Holocaust is the name given to one specific case of genocide that was unprecedented in its totality. The attempt to destroy the Jewish people of Europe and all traces of Jewish culture, history, and memory. By the end of the Holocaust, six million Jewish men, women, and children had been murdered in ghettos, mass shootings, concentration camps, and death camps. The genocide of the Roma took place during the Holocaust, as did the murder of hundreds of thousands of other people who were victims of Nazi atrocities. In all cases of genocide, 
People have been targeted because of their ethnicity, religious beliefs, or cultural affiliations. In Armenia, over one million people were murdered between 1915 and the end of the Great War. In Cambodia in the 1970s, it is estimated that two million people were murdered by the Khmer Rouge, and in Rwanda in the 1990s, over a million people were murdered, often by neighbors and people they knew who joined the bands of killers in hand-to-hand -hand killings. In Bosnia, more than 8,000 Muslim men and boys were massacred in Srebrenica in 1995 in the single largest mass murder in Europe since 1945. Genocide is not a single event in time, but a gradual process that begins when discrimination, racism, and hatred are not checked. We are mindful of the words of Yehuda Bauer, who tells us that the Holocaust can happen again to others, not necessarily Jews, perpetrated by others, not necessarily Germans. We are all possible victims, possible perpetrators, possible bystanders. It is customary at Holocaust memorial events to light six candles in memory of the six million Jewish people who perished in the Shoah. In Ireland, we also light candles in memory of all the victims of Nazi atrocities. In memory of people with disabilities and disabling conditions, I invite Sinead Friel of the Down Syndrome Advisory Council and Blue Diamond Drama Academy to give her reading. Bernard Johnson of the Chorus Centre and Senator John Dolan of the Disability Federation of Ireland will light their candles. The Nazis decided that people with disabilities do not deserve to live. One of the Nazi programs murdered thousands of persons who were with disabilities. People with special needs were among for the first targets of the Nazis. The Nazis thought that taking care of disabilities cost too much money. So they want to get rid of people like me and other people with disabilities. Doctors and nurses took part of the killing with Disabilities using lethal injections, starvation, and gas. Over 300,000 people with disabilities were murdered by the Nazis. We will always remember. In memory of ethnic minorities, Poles, and other Slavic peoples who were murdered, displaced, and forcibly Aryanized by the Nazis, I invite Teresa Buchkowska, immigrant of the Immigrant Council of Ireland, to give her reading. Barnaba Dorda, chair of Forum Polonia, and Salome Bugwa of Akidwa will light their candles. Those who did not fit the Nazi image of the supreme Aryan race, such as Poles, Slavs, and ethnic minorities, were murdered, displaced, forcibly sterilized, and incarcerated in concentration camps. In addition to three million Polish Jews, it is estimated that, that more than two million non-Jewish Polish victims were also murdered in the Holocaust. Polish children were kidnapped and placed with German families to be Aryanized 
enrolled as Germans. Commission number three was a program of forced sterilization of hundreds of people of African ancestry because the Nuremberg racial laws had stated that black people belonged to an inferior race. Thousands of other ethnic minorities were also victims of the Nazis. We will always remember. The genocide of the Roma took place during the Holocaust. It is estimated that as many as half a million Romani people were murdered by the Nazis and their collaborators. I invite Gabby Muntian of the Roma Project at Pavi Point to give her reading. Salomia Durbala and Alex Butika of the Roma community will light their candles. It is difficult to know the exact numbers of the Roma people who were murdered by the Nazis, but the estimates put the figures between a quarter and a half a million. Hundreds of thousands of Roma and Sindhi people were rounded up forces into ghettos and deported to concentration and death camps. They were an identifying black triangle on their camp uniform where they subjected to brutality, starvation, disease, medical experiments, or gas to death. In our language, we call the murder of the Romani people during the Holocaust the Projamos, the Great Devouring. We will always remember. In memory of the homosexual men and women who were persecuted and murdered during the Holocaust before, because of their sexual orientation, I invite Councillor Alan Edge to give his reading. Money and Griffith of Belong To and Max Krasinovsky will light their candles. The vibrant cultural and inclusive society that was prevalent in Berlin in the 1930s changed dramatically when the Nazis came to power. Thousands of gay men were arrested and imprisoned in concentration camps, where they were subjected to harder work, less food, and greater brutality than other inmates. Thousands were put to death. Lesbians were identified as asocials and treated as common criminals. The criminalization and social stigmatization of homosexuals in Europe and the United States remained in force for many years after World War II. Many homosexual survivors of Nazi persecution were not acknowledged as victims of the Holocaust. Some even had to serve out the terms of their original prison sentences, which did not take into account the time they had spent incarcerated in concentration camps. For that reason, few homosexual survivors of the Holocaust ever told their stories. We will always remember. In memory of the political victims, I invite Liam Herrick, Executive Director of the Irish Council for Civil Liberties, to give his reading. Kim Bielenberg, whose grandfather participated in the July plot to assassinate Hitler in 1944, and Maeve Price of the Department of Education and Skills will light their candles. As early as 1933, the Nazis established the first concentration camp, Dachau, as a place of detention for political prisoners, followed by Sachsenhausen and other camps a couple of years later. The Nazis persecuted and murdered thousands of political opponents, some for what they did, some for what they refused to do, and some for what they were. Communists, trade unionists, and social democrats were brutally suppressed, strikes were prohibited, trade unions and cooperatives were abolished, their assets confiscated. In 1934, the Night of the Long Knives was Hitler's great purge when he ruthlessly persecuted and murdered his political opponents in their hundreds. Ridding the Nazi party of those he distrusted as well as some of his devoted friends and anti-Nazi figures within Germany. We will always remember. In 
in memory of the Christian victims of all denominations who were persecuted and murdered during the Holocaust, I invite Breed Dunn, chaplain of Pertumna Community School, to give her reading. Retired Methodist minister Vanessa Wise Jackson and Catherine O'Dea of the Religious Society of Friends will light their candles. The Nazis persecuted and murdered Catholics, Protestants and others of Christian affiliation. Jehovah's Witnesses were targeted for refusing to salute Hitler or to serve the German army. Thousands of priests, nuns and teachers were put to death for opposing the Nazis or for helping to save Jews during the Holocaust. We recall the Quakers who worked tirelessly to assist those trying to escape from Hitler's tyranny. There were many thousands of righteous Christians and thousands of Christian victims. We will always remember. Six candles are dedicated to the memory of the six million Jewish people, including one and a half million children who were annihilated in the Holocaust. Jews were murdered in concentration camps, labor camps, and death camps. Jews perished in the ghettos. Jews died of starvation and disease. Jews were shot in the forests and in their villages, and Jews were murdered in the streets and in their homes. Those lighting candles in memory of the Jewish victims of the Holocaust are children or grandchildren of Holocaust survivors, second and third generation. All of them lost countless members of their families in the Holocaust. I invite Tony Collis, whose grandfather Zoltan Zinn and great aunt Edith survived Bergen-Belsen concentration camp, but whose other family members perished in the Holocaust. Kyla Hertz, whose grandfather Wolf Hertz escaped the massacre in Bernitza Forest and whose great-grandparents Lenka and Avram Moshkovich survived Auschwitz, but whose other family members perished in the Holocaust. Joram Toker, whose great-uncle David, Aunt Jeanette Jalassen, Paul and Sarah Talma and other family members perished in the Holocaust. Dick Le Bloom, whose grandfather, Masha Halperin, grandmother, Bella Halperin, and great aunt, Sarah Halperin, survived, but whose great grandparents, Mikael and Henia Halperin, and great uncle, Joseph Halperin, and other family members perished in the Holocaust. Joe Katz, whose mother, Frida, survived Auschwitz, but who had many other family members perish in the Holocaust. Charlotte Kaplan, whose father Raphael Erbach survived Buchenwald and Theresienstadt concentration camps, but whose other family members perished in the Holocaust. We will always remember. The first Holocaust Memorial in Ireland was unveiled in 1995 in the Garden of Europe in Listowel, County Kerry. Paddy Fitzgibbon, who inaugurated the project, delivered a moving speech at the time. I invite Lynn Jackson, one of the founding trustees of Holocaust Education Trust Ireland, to read an extract from Paddy's profound words on that occasion. Our generation, and the generation or two after us, will be the last that will be able to say that we stood and shook the hands of some of those who survived. Go home from this place, and tell your children, and your grandchildren, and your great-grandchildren that today you looked into the eyes that witnessed the most cataclysmic events ever unleashed by mankind upon mankind. 
Tell them that you met people who will still be remembered and still talked about and still wept over 10,000 years from now, because if they are not, there will be no hope for us at all. The Holocaust happened, and it can happen again. And every one of us, if only out of our own sense of self-preservation, has a solemn duty to ensure that nothing like it ever occurs again. I invite Rabbi Zalman Lent and Carl Nelkin of the Irish Jew Jewish community to recite the prayer for the repose of the souls of the departed. Please stand. O oh God, full of mercy who dwells on high, grant proper rest on the sheltering wings of your divine presence among the holy and pure who shine like the brightness of the firmament, for the souls of all the holy and pure and innocent who were killed, murdered, slaughtered, burned, drowned, and strangled at the hands of the Nazi oppressors in Auschwitz, Belzec, Bergen-Belsen, Dachau, Chelmno, Majdanek, Sobibor, Treblinka, and other concentration and death camps in Europe. We now pray for those souls. May their resting places be in the Garden of Eden. And so may the Master of Mercy shelter them for eternity with the cover of his wings, and may he bind their souls in the bond of eternal life. May the Lord be their inheritance, and may they repose in peace upon their heavenly resting places. And let us say, Amen. Amen. Evelyn Byrne to give her closing remarks. During the Holocaust, 
civilized society became complicit in mass murder and in genocide. Let's not forget that. Medicine and education were perverted for use in killing and disabling and in fermenting racism and hatred. Let's not forget that. To us now falls the memorialization, the burden of that memorialization. Because when memories grow dim, the lessons of history grow dangerously far away. As our annual Holocaust Memorial Day draws to a close, it is incumbent on each one of us as individuals in our own hearts and souls to commit ourselves from whatever religious, ethnic, cultural or political persuasion we come to rededicate ourselves to truly eradicating racism from our midst and to silence those voices that seek to deny that the Holocaust ever happened, because happened it did. It falls to each of us to ensure that we, as we engage in our everyday tasks, our normal daily lives, that we commit to actions which will ensure that the conditions of fear and distrust find no fertile ground in which the horrors of actions like the Holocaust will ever happen again, because happen again they can. We will not be victims. We will not be perpetrators. And very importantly, we will not be bystanders. We will remember, we will cherish those who have been lost. But most of all, we will take action for the future. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us in this evening of solemn commemoration.